This need to get thrown up here. Here we go. My name is Alex Stiefel. I'm 18 years old. Currently, and I was, I'm from Rainsville, so I actually live right over there. I, a few days away from here, I just walk here. I've, I've won two state beta conventions. I've gotten uh, two, two, I've won two state championships for social studies and two runner-ups at nationals, one in Savannah and one in, uh, let's see, yeah, Oklahoma City, yeah. And I also went to a mission trip in Arlington, Texas in December of 2019. And I worked there for about a week. I'll stop that now and move on to what this is actually about, which is art. You know, the um, visual representation of reality. It can be through paper, sculpture, sculpting, there's many different ways. I'm going to show some of them here from, his, from, his, from the historical record. Here's some of my, this is some of my favorite ones actually. Some, this is Paleolithic cave art. The first one is the Cueva de los Manos from Argentina, which has his hands, it was, this means cave of hands, and this is the Hall of Bulls at the Wausau Caves in France. Hmm? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot this game. Yeah. Oh, I'm looking at on this computer and I'm getting, yeah. But that's the art I'm talking about there. The Hall of Bulls depicts the a ancient ancestor of cows called the Oryx. And there's also a little saw in other caves in France of various other various ancient animals that existed in Europe during during that time period when those were made, like lions, hyenas, mammoths, various animals like that. And they kind of give us a sort of very little glimpse into what ancient people back then were like, you know. Part of, that's part of how I think the, the good is here, is that it preserves a lot of this art, and some of the things I'm going to show later is going to preserve culture. Culture is a very intrinsic part of what makes us human. And art is a, is a way that kind of preserves that in a way, our ways of lives, what people, what, who people were, what they experienced throughout their lives. And I'm going to show some other ones here. The first one is from an ancient civilization like the Dolphins. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting that. I'm just going to get this computer out of my way. That is a Minoan fresco. The Minoans were a Bronze Age civilization that lived in the Mediterranean and Crete. And a lot of what we know about them through their culture comes from a lot of their art because we don't know what their writing system actually is. We don't really know what it's actually saying. So their art kind of gives us some ideas of what their culture was like. And this one was a picking from dolphins. And the other one was of a Greek poet called Sappho that was found, and this painting of her was found in Pompeii. And Pompeii kind of gives us the same thing that the Creek, the Creek city of Gnosis does for Roman culture, because it preserves a lot of explicitly preserved pieces of art of, from, from the time period of Rome or the first century. This is a, some Greek, no, not Greek, oh, I'm saying Greek, this is from, this is some, oh, I'm trying to, this is some stained glass art from Canterbury in England, from medieval, from medieval England. And the picture of the resurrection, as you can see on there. Another aspect of art that's very important for us is symbolism. Humans communicate with symbolism a lot. It's kind of how we sort of inter internalize the world. Like, you know, some of those eagles up there, for example, they kind of are symbols in a way. They're like symbols of, you know, like how eagles fly. You know that song, that's it's our alma mater, eagles soar high? It's kind of like that. It's an example of being exemplary, hard work. It's a, it's a symbol of that. And this sort of, and a lot of this sort of art from you see in medieval stained glass kind of, kind of
kind of represents that. These sort of symbols that need to communicate values and ideas, in, in a way. Now this is some Japanese art from the 19th century. One of these is of a... This is, this is another example of some of the preservation of culture. We got the first one, which is of a... Um, this is the Witch Takayasha, which is a story, it's a long rabbit hole of a story, I'm not going to go into, of her summoning a skeleton for something I'm not, I can't really get into because it's too long and I don't have time. And the second one is uh, from Hokusai. He, he's the famous artist who made The Great Wave, some of you might be familiar with. This is from his art pieces of waterfalls that he made. He made a lot of paintings of natural scenery, and they were kind of like, what they had back then were the equivalent of souvenirs because there was no photography back then. And so preserving these kind of pictures of natural scenes of God's creation is kind of how they preserve images of that, you know? It's kind of a, it's, rep it's a representation of, even though these people were Buddhists, they didn't really believe in, they were not Christians, but they kind of preserved what God's creation in a way. They showed us his, his design, his, the beauty of his, and what he created through, through, this, through these artistic masterpieces like this. And that's still a earlier to quote here. Humans love, recognize, and communicate in symbolism. That's why the human race is created for millennia and why people cry watching movies, because you know a lot of a lot of people get emotional when watching movies. And it's for it's for that reason. This symbolism is formed and shaped our understanding of the world and culture and how God, how God himself works, you know? Another thing I'm going to focus on is it also shows us kind of how we view even Christianity itself. So these two pieces here, oh yeah, well, I will, yeah, this is a painting of Jesus by the German painter Heinrich Hoffmann. A lot of his art that you may have probably seen before, and his representation of Christ is how although a lot of people kind of view Jesus as this sort of guy with the flowing robes and the long hair and the beard. That kind of, that's kind of one of the people who kind of helped solidify that sort of idea of Jesus as being a, of being that way. And a lot of earlier art, some early art, like for Jesus may have been depicted a little bit differently in very early Christian art. Like in some, I remember, he didn't even have a beard in some carving room they found in Syria. So, and this other one is the depiction of God by Michelangelo in Sistine Chapel. That's a very famous painting. Maybe we should be familiar with. And it's basically showing God. It's how a lot of people kind of view God as an old man, and it's partially because of paintings like this from Michelangelo. You can see how a lot of art also influences how we view reality itself from this. Artistic prowess also aligns with the message of the school and Miss Travis's message about, you know, do hard things. Regardless of the medium, it's a craft that takes years of study to excel at. The greatest masters, like the ones I showed you there, they, they, they studied probably for years, like their whole lives, and had to perfect their craft over a period of many years of work and study. It was a very, art used to be a very, uh, I don't know what word, it used to be a very meticulous craft. And it was basically like a job for a lot of people in, ancient, in the ancient world. So this really fits under the axiom of a few hard things, in my opinion. And next, I'm going to show you what was kind of my scrap that I was originally going to do, but I wasn't able to do it to its full extent, when I learned that we only have a maximum time of 15 minutes. And so I needed to make, I was going to make a sort of artistic representation of some of the first cantos from Dante from the medieval poem Inferno. And I'll show you some, some pictures from that that kind of show, I don't know, but I put them in a scan tonight, I don't know if I can see Can you see that? Okay, yeah, so that's a picture of Dante when he's walking through the, through the sort of the desert. Essentially, I thought to represent what I talked about in the first canto, I, I interpreted it as being kind of a desert environment. And so I depicted that, it's kind of hard to see though. I had mountains in the back, it's hard to see. This is the next one. Uh, the next one was, I don't know if it's, it's not easy to see, I kind of decided to draw him going through a sort of canyon. 
and has all these sort of fossil remains of animals like a Sigurdjur dixiosaur in there, and some ammonites and trilobites and other sort of ancient marine animals in this sort of canyon. Which you could maybe interpret as being deposited there by like a flood of some kind. I don't know. Yeah, this is the scene where they kind of where you kind of meet the three animals. In, in, in the poem, he's attacked by a wolf, a leopard, and a lion. And I decided to depict them kind of eating the carcass of a hadrosaur. And he's running through the city and these huge columns that kind of lead up to the heavenly city. And here's the one that I think was probably the most decent one I made when I depicted the wolf, the wolf's face. Because that's basically the wolf that kind of, and originally it was going to like sort of chase him for a while, and he's then kind of saved by Virgil. And he meets a Virgil later on, he leads them through hell and heaven, and uh, maybe not hell, leads them through hell and purgatory, so we can then reach heaven. And there's the wolf. And yeah, I think that's it. Now, now I'm going to go through my acknowledgments here. I like to say the staff of CCA, all the teachers over there, yeah, like Ms. West, Ms. Clowers, Ms. Travis, you're all, you're all great. <laughs> and I'm also going to say my, my parents, because, you know, they're kind of why I exist. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, so, so have, have a good night. <laughs>